Hi everyone, and welcome to today's session. I am Jeremy from EHN Canada. We are a nationwide network of treatment centers for addiction, trauma, and mental health. We have facilities located in Nanaimo, British Columbia, Calgary, Alberta, Toronto and Peterborough, Ontario, Montreal, Quebec, and Annapolis County, Nova Scotia. We offer high quality inpatient, outpatient, and online treatment programs. For more information, please visit our website at ehncanada.com. Just in terms of housekeeping, everyone is on mute and cameras are off for today's webinar, but please feel free to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for our speakers. We will try to get to as many questions as possible at the end of today's session. Today's webinar is being recorded and we will be sending out a follow-up email sometime mid to late next week that will include the link to the video, today's slides, and any useful resources mentioned, as well as your CEU certificate. I am located in Toronto. Toronto is located on the traditional territory of several nations, including the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. It is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississauga of the Credit. Amanda and Andrea are located in Mississauga, which is part of the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Wainat Nations. If you are new to this work and want to find out whose land you're on or grew up on, please check out native-land.ca. Many more of you may be physically present elsewhere. I encourage everyone to use the chat function to, where applicable, share whose land you are on. Now to get to today's session, avoidance and regulating our emotions. We have Andrea Barrero. Andrea is a registered psychotherapist currently working in her private practice. She has provided mental health treatment in community and hospital settings. Her personal experience as a third culture individual and an immigrant gives her a keen perspective on issues impacting people today. She is passionate about working with clients, navigating depression, anxiety, and trauma. We also have Amanda Meyer. Amanda is a registered social worker who works in private practice. Her professional experience includes mental health care in community, hospital, and education systems in Canada and internationally. Amanda's current clinical work focuses on therapy for individuals with mood, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorders, as well as attachment and relationship issues. She has specialized training in attachment theory, trauma therapy, and cognitive behavioral therapy. Thank you so much for joining us today, Amanda and Andrea. Go ahead and take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As Jeremy introduced, my name is Amanda and I'm joined by Andrea. Um, we're really excited to talk to you about this topic today. So I want to just go over quickly our agenda before we get started. Um, so we are going to give you a little bit of an introduction on what we mean when we say avoidance. We're going to talk about why we avoid. We're going to discuss the impact that avoidance can have on us. And then we'll discuss some healthier coping strategies if we feel like we are all avoiding too much. So this topic is interesting to both of us on a professional and a personal level. Uh, we work with a lot of clients that are dealing with maybe over avoidance um, or too much avoidance. And then we also notice it in our own lives. So we'll probably throw some personal examples at you as well. Oftentimes when we hear the word avoidance, we kind of have a negative connotation that goes along with it. So at the bottom of the screen, we just have a little reminder which we will keep circling back to throughout the presentation, which is that avoidance isn't necessarily negative and it isn't always a choice. So a lot of times we think people just choose to avoid, choose to not face their problems. That is not really what we mean when we say avoidance. So if you notice that you kind of are taking on that definition yourself, just try to look at it as a more broad term of sometimes it is a coping strategy. It isn't negative all the time. There are times when it can become negative and it isn't always a choice that we make. Sometimes it happens unconsciously. So we just like to have that little disclaimer and then we will get into the definition now. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Andrea. And before we jump in into the topic of avoidance, it's important for us to briefly discuss what emotions are and why we have them. 
Um, emotions may seem simplistic, however, they are incredibly complex and difficult to define as well, because there are multiple theories and schools of thoughts that unfortunately we don't have the time to review today. So we will work with this bird's eye view definition for now. So in a nutshell, emotions are universal responses to internal or external stimuli and that include physiological, cognitive and behavioral components. So we all know how it feels in our bodies when we experience fear or excitement or any other intense emotion. Those are easier to pick up on at a body level. Uh, emotions also influence how we think and they are impacted by how we think. And the same is true for our behavior. Emotions influence how we respond and they are also impacted by our actions. Uh, the most important thing that we really wanna draw your attention to is the function of emotions, which is to communicate to ourselves, to communicate to others, and to organize and motivate behavior. The last two functions mentioned here in this slide are familiar concepts to all of us. For example, think about how we all have been educated in how important nonverbal communication is. That's, that's talking about how emotions communicate to others. Uh, we also know by experience that there's a strong connection between our emotions and our actions, our behavior. However, for some reason, we uh, sometimes are unaware that emotions communicate to ourselves. And a big contributor for that is the belief that some emotions are positive and others are negative. That's inaccurate information. And it's also unhelpful information because when we feel something, that emotion is highlighting that there's a particular need in us that requires our attention. So all emotions are crucial. Some are more pleasant and some are more challenging and no emotion is inherently good or bad. So if we're going to explore the topic of avoidance, it's important to know that emotions aren't there simply to bug us or make our lives difficult. Uh, understanding that we experience emotions for a reason will motivate us to stop avoiding them all the time if that's something we do. So then that brings us to definition of avoidance. What is it? Well, the general definition is the practice or an instance of keeping away from particular situations, environments, individuals, or things because of either A, the anticipated negative consequence of such an encounter, or B, anxious or painful feelings associated with them. And our particular focus today is going to be on avoidance scoping, which is any strategy for managing a stressful situation in which a person does not address the problem directly, but instead disengages from the situation and averts attention from it. So in other words, the person turns away from processing information that can be triggering for them. And there are many other names or examples for how we engage in this avoidance scoping. And this is maybe something that will feel more closer to our experience. For example, escapism, which is seeking distraction and relief from unpleasant realities, especially by seeking entertainment or engaging in fantasy. So binge watching a show, reading an engrossing book nonstop, listening to appealing podcasts, even exercising and work, all good things can be used to escape from the, real, from the real world to the delight or security of a fantasy world. Um, substance use or misuse is another one. When we seek substances to alter our state of consciousness or allow for a different way of engagement with current circumstances. Uh, these, these behaviors sought to numb our emotions are very reinforcing and also paradoxical. Amanda and I were talking about this the other day and it's interesting how at the same time, that same substance use or misuse will help us avoid. And then there's a tipping point when it goes all the way to the other side. Suddenly we're totally open and in touch and at the mercy of the things we were trying to avoid uh, in the first place. Um, then there's also social isolation, which stereotypically is um, you know, being seen as being alone all the time in a room, in a basement, but that's not, all that we mean by social isolation. There's much more to, to that. Uh, when we're trying to avoid conflict at all costs, when we dread responding to texts or calls and we end up not doing it all together, uh, when we are super effective at communicating when the situation is work-related, however, 
we don't uh, we don't dare to share any real information about our inner inner world with other people. All of those are ways to isolate from others. And functioning adults are very skillful at avoiding while being socially pleasant. Um, so that's another one. Um, compartmentalization is another one. It's a defense mechanism in which thoughts and feelings that seem to conflict or to be incompatible are isolated from each other in separate and apparently impermeable psychological compartments. So we push away things that are not appealing for us right now and we just kind of try to forget about it as, as long as we can. Then there's also overregulation of emotions, which is a facet of emotion dysregulation. Again, we usually think about a person that is emotionally dysregulated when there's a outward display of emotions. So raised voices, tears, all those, all those um, cues that tell us, oh, this person is not okay. However, a person may seem very calm on the outside and still be emotionally dysregulated because they are coping by suppressing, minimizing, or shutting down what they're actually feeling. And then suddenly, definitely the vein of my existence, procrastination, <laughs> uh, which is the action of delaying or postponing something. And here we find it very important to say that procrastination is not laziness. Okay, we hear a lot of people say, I'm so lazy, I procrastinate all the time. These are two actually different things. Uh, laziness is defined as the quality of being unwilling to work or use energy. So the person that is lazy isn't even concerned with what needs to get done. They don't have a to-do list. If you're constantly worried and distressed about pending items on your to-do list and yet don't seem to be able to get to them, chances are you're procrastinating precisely because you're not lazy. So generally, all these different avoidance strategies have a bad reputation, especially when compared to healthier coping mechanism, mechanisms. However, avoidance strategies may provide some benefit by reducing stress and preventing anxiety from becoming overwhelming in the moment. So no matter how we avoid, all these strategies serve the primary purpose of protecting us temporarily from uncomfortable or challenging situations and emotions. And Amanda will tell us more about that now. Thanks, Andrea. Um, I am trying to move our slide, but it is not moving right now. There we go. Um, so yeah, as Andrea said, there's been, there's lots of different ways that we avoid kind of throughout our daily life. Um, I, we hope that some of you are able to relate to some of them or identify with them, because certainly as she goes through the list, I can sort of identify all the different ones that I do um, on a daily basis. It's important for us though to understand why we do this because it's not simply something that we don't want to deal with our problems. We don't feel like dealing with things. There are biological and relationship reasons why either we consciously or unconsciously choose to avoid. So we have to kind of go back um, and do a little overview of our autonomic nervous system in order to understand why we avoid. So a lot of you are probably familiar with our nervous system. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of it today because we don't have time. But in general, our nervous system is there as a surveillance system. So it is sort of like a house alarm when it's activated, which is all the time. It's playing in the background. We're not necessarily aware of it. We don't know always if our alarm or our fire alarm is running, but it is there to sense danger. So when there's any actual danger or perception of danger, our nervous system will mobilize. And when it mobilizes, it's our sympathetic branch that becomes active, which pretty much most people know as our fight or flight response. So our fight or flight response is going to kick in if there's a real threat, or there's something that we think of as a threat or a danger or a concern. When that happens, we have a lot of different sensations that are very uncomfortable. So our fight or flight response is associated with all those things like fast heart rate, um, faster breathing, butterflies in our stomach, dry throat, all of those different sensations come when our nervous system is activated. 
there are times when those sensations become so uncomfortable that we will actually choose to avoid. And we will choose to use any of the strategies that Andrea talked about because we want to get rid of those really uncomfortable sensations, especially if we know that there's no real immediate danger in front of us. So for example, even when preparing for a presentation like this, there are moments where I was preparing the other day, I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking, oh, like, this is hard, I hope they understand what we're talking about, I hope we don't get criticized too much, I don't know what's going on. As soon as I have those thoughts, that kicked off my sympathetic branch of my nervous system to tell me, oh, there's something wrong, there's a threat, there's a danger. I start feeling all of these uncomfortable sensations. And next thing I know, I'm no longer looking at my screen, but I'm looking at my phone and I'm on Instagram. So there are times when our nervous system is telling us something's wrong and we are so uncomfortable with those sensations that we have to get ourselves away from them. And it works temporarily. Even further than that, there are times when our nervous system is activated, we're in our fight or flight mode, and things just get so intense, either we become so overwhelmed, or our nervous system is telling us the danger is so extreme, we don't know how to get out of it, that our nervous system kind of flips or shifts into a different type of activation, which is our parasympathetic nervous system, and then our freeze response becomes active. So our freeze response is those times when we don't know how to get out. We start to feel numb. We're not necessarily feeling those really active sensations anymore, but we're feeling disconnected and numb and we're dissociating. Likewise, if our nervous system has perceived so much danger that it's flipped into that activation, then we don't necessarily have the choice to avoid at that point. Everything in us, everything in our biology is telling us to shut down. So we may become inactive. We may not be able to face the things that we're trying to face. So that's a really, really basic understanding of kind of what's happening. But it's so important for us to understand that there are times when we are going to make the choice to avoid because we are feeling just so overwhelmed and uncomfortable with our fight or flight mode. And there are times when we are so overwhelmed by what's happening around us or in us that our body goes into a freeze state. And then we're likewise not facing the things that we need to face. So I think of two of my um, clients when I think of this example. And I have one client who is very aware that the sensations that come when she is anxious, so the sensation of that fast heart rate and of the breathing and just that general um, tenseness and tightness and all the racing thoughts that have come with it are just so uncomfortable for her, she hates to deal with them. So she chooses to go back to sleep, use marijuana and cope in those ways. So on its surface, we would say, oh, like those are avoidance strategies. Those are avoidance and we need you to work through them. But there has to be that understanding that they have become something that she has learned as a way to cope with the intensity of her discomfort. On the flip side, I have another client who has had many difficult experiences um, with her family. So she has tried many, many different ways to communicate effectively with her family. And each and every way she tries is sort of faced with the same rejection and punishment. So when someone is trying their very best in all the different ways that they can, and they still face rejection and those painful things, she's actually gone into almost that freeze state when she's faced with conflict. So this is a person who isn't saying, I'm choosing to avoid. This is a person that came to therapy saying, I can't speak when I am faced with conflict. I actually cannot form the words, I cannot speak. So people look at her and say, oh, you're just avoiding conflict. Oh, like just talk, just talk, just talk. But her nervous system has said no. We, we can't find a way out of this. We're overwhelmed. And she goes into a shutdown mode. So kind of these examples are just meant to show how wide this idea of avoidance is and how it just isn't quite as simple as the basic concept of like doing another activity in order to avoid our problems. The second point here is really important. 
it, it covers the fact that avoidance is protective, accessible, and effective in the short run. So we've just talked about how it's protective, right? When I'm feeling that incredible rush of anxiety that, oh my goodness, no one's going to like this presentation, and I start to lose all sense of my ability to think clearly, scrolling around Instagram settled me down. It actually regulated it. So it protected me from getting incredibly overwhelmed in the moment. I still had to prepare later, but it helped in the moment. It's also accessible. So my phone is around me. We are now living a life where we're doing everything on screen. If you look around your own space, there are so many ways that you can probably avoid. We have TVs with us. We have phones with us. We have everything around us. And avoidance tends to be accessible. And the most important part is how effective it is in the short run. It really does tend to provide that immediate relief that we're looking for. Right. So being able to sort of say, OK, if I just avoid, if I just procrastinate, if I get out of this, I'm going to feel that sense of immediate relief. And once I experience that, I know it's there for me and I'm going to want to do it more and more. So I think we've kind of covered this already, but it's important for us to just really normalize this experience. We all do it. Moderate levels of avoidance are okay. We actually can't face life's challenges 100% of the time with 100% of our energy. So there are there's usefulness to being able to take breaks and to being able to kind of take time for ourselves. Maybe we do need to isolate to protect ourselves sometimes. We really just can't face everything all at once. It does temporarily reduce our stress, like I talked about with my example, which then prevents our stress from becoming overwhelming. And an important thing that we like to highlight is that COVID-19 has like been around for two years. We've all been living in a pandemic. It's been a time when we have all had things that we enjoy, things that we love taken away from us without any control over it. So if you think about how overwhelming that is, a lot of us, all of us, I would argue, have needed to avoid in some way or another to be able to really cope with the fact that we don't have control and we can't predict the future and we don't know what it's going to look like. So I was looking up a, a little bit of research here um, and there is a study that was out of the University of Toronto recently and it found that alcohol sales in Canada increased by $2 million a day in the first uh, four months of the pandemic. And then there was a U.S. study that was looking at online shopping, and they found that between 2020 and 2021, online shopping sales increased by $218 billion. Understandably, part of that is because stores were closed, but other parts were that we, we found comfort, we found enjoyment in escaping and in buying and in just getting ourselves out of the reality of what was happening around us. So we all needed those strategies. We all needed those ways of coping when there, we're in situations that are overwhelming and when we're in situations that we just can't change, which then begs the question of what is the point of facing it in the first place if it's uh, something that we can't change. So we really want to highlight now this up until now we're talking about what it is we're normalizing it, why we all do it. Um, it plays out in our nervous system. It plays out in our relationships. And kind of moving forward, we now want to talk about what do we do about it and how do we know when it's becoming too intense and it needs to be dealt with. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. I love, I love that question of if we are really in a situation where there's not a lot of control, we can't change the situation, Why? why not? Why wouldn't we just go by avoiding? And there are a few reasons why, why we wouldn't do that. Um, there's a, a real impact when it comes to excessive avoidance. The more we avoid, the more we feel we need to avoid. And the more we feel we need to avoid, the worse the feelings get. And so it's a spiral. This avoidance cycle really um, uh, highlighted. It's a spiral that just leads to more of the things that we don't like about feeling anxious. Um, 
this is also uh, motivated by the fallacy that we have the so-called bad emotions and that those should be left aside. Uh, the thing is, once we learn how to shut down these so-called negative emotions, we also stop being able to feel the positive ones. Uh, so all emotions share the same mechanism. Once we learn to shut it down and disconnect, it will be more challenging to experience the joy, peace, and satisfaction we crave. Plus, that's a lie. Like we said at the beginning, emotions aren't good or bad. Just because something is difficult, it doesn't mean it's bad. And we know this internally and at a conscious level as well. When it comes to, for example, hard work in our professional lives or consistent physical exercise for our health, we just don't apply these two emotions. So all emotions are needed, even if it's difficult to experience them. And then when we use avoidance as our go-to coping mechanism, there's a big thing that we are teaching ourselves. And that is that we cannot tolerate difficult situations. And that can become really problematic. Because if we believe that we are limited in our coping, that will significantly impact our view of ourselves. So if something that feels good in the moment leads us to believe that you're not capable of dealing with life circumstances, that will have a long-term detrimental impact in how we feel about ourselves, how we engage with the world, what we believe is possible for us in the future. And that's really when avoidance then becomes, then we need to avoid not just the discomfort of how we were feeling, but also now the fact that we believe that we can't deal with whatever is in front of us. Um, and finally, avoidance is exhausting. It prevents us from engaging in life, engaging in relationships the way that we'd like to. We have to keep repeating the patterns or behavior that uh, don't ultimately lead to long-term satisfaction so that we can feel a little bit okay in the moment. And so we miss out on opportunities to be present, to participate, to contribute, to create meaning with others, the, to build the life that we actually dream about living. When we are excessively avoiding, we are missing out on ourselves and what we could be in the world that, that we live in. Uh, so that's really what leads us then to say, um, okay, so how can we do this differently? How can we find ways to move from avoidance to healthier coping. Um, and, the, and this is something we wanna, we wanna offer again, may seem simple, but actually quite hard to put in practice. Uh, and it's a, a definitely a way that is way harder at the beginning. And then at the end or long-term, it will yield much um, more impactful and better uh, long-term results. So the first uh, encouragement we have is the importance of recognizing avoidance. Uh, one way to do that is by reflecting on the present, this presentation, things you heard from us, and seeing how you can identify uh, how it shows up in your own life. Uh, there's a, a need here to do this mindfully. And what we mean by that is with curiosity and non-judgment. Um, the more curious and non-judgmental we are, the more we're able to understand about how we avoid and why we avoid it. So it's really, really important to just take a step back and take a few moments. Doesn't need to be an hour. It can be five minutes. It can be ten minutes. But just really think. Oh, I don't. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe that's me, and I see myself right away. Or maybe I don't even know how that's showing up for me. But really recognizing what are the physical sensations, thoughts, emotions that really push my nervous system to think that I'm unsafe. And then I start engaging in avoidance. And then the, the next uh, piece here is to practice self-compassion. And this is an important one because there's lots of, uh, of misconceptions about what self-compassion is. So I'm gonna start with the, with the second point and then go back to the first. So showing self-compassion for avoidance is more effective to generate change than self-criticism or pressure. So some people may equate self-compassion with softness, lack of drive, giving up, stop challenging myself. And that isn't what self-compassion is. 
we tend to think that self-criticism and pressure will motivate us to do the things we want. However, when we actually look at the facts, we realize that the more we engage in these things, the self-criticism and the judgmental uh, posture towards ourselves, it's actually the opposite. We continue to create and foster those emotions that we really don't want to feel. And that leads us into avoiding even more. So if we want to see change, we need to employ an approach that doesn't include beating ourselves up. And that is self-compassion. And so when we talk about self-compassion, uh, we're not talking about bubble baths, facials, <laughs> and other forms of self-care. Those are important and can be effective if that's what works for you. But that's not what we mean here by self-compassion. In this con context, practicing self-compassion really means remembering that avoidance is protective and serves a purpose. A purpose. It's important to find ways to practice self-compassion that work for you. It requires learning about how we talk to ourselves and started to do it, starting to do it in a way that is helpful, even if it feels foreign at first. So there's multiple ways that, that we can engage in practicing with self-compassion and not all ways are going to resonate with all people, which is really important. I, I remember having a, a conversation with a client that read a self-compassion uh, meditation written by uh, Kristen Neff, I think that's her name, which is very popular and very used, but for some reason that didn't resonate with her. So we need to find ways to apply this in our lives that, that are feel truth and things that we can believe. So if bubble baths and facials are it for you, great. If not, that's okay too. Find a way to remind yourself, you know what, when I'm doing this thing that I actually don't like and I have a hard time coping with, I'm doing it for a reason. I'm doing it because something feels unsafe here. And I need to learn to communicate to myself that I'm safe so that I can engage with life in, in a way that, that is true to me. And Amanda will tell us more about this as well. Okay, thanks, Andrea. Um, yeah, I think that it really speaks to um, the importance of even you being here today and learning about it, uh, learning about this topic, because we really do want to be able to show ourselves compassion, even like I'm doing, like I can poke fun at myself for recognizing as I avoid all of my friends, Andrea included, know that it's a common uh, coping strategy for me. So it's helpful to recognize and be compassionate even to myself of, okay, something was happening the other day that led me to feel like I needed my phone temporarily. But I was able to then kind of bring myself back because I came at it with compassion and not with judgment. If I had judged myself harshly of why can't I just focus? Why does any of this bother me? I probably would have been even more anxious moving forward. So those are two like really important points to start with. And other things that we can consider as we are trying to move to sort of healthier coping is the importance of actually identifying what are our values and our goals? Mm -hmm. So a lot of these terms you're gonna see on this slide are common, they're, they're buzzwords, a lot of them, but we'll talk about them a little bit in the way that we mean in particular with avoidance. When we're thinking about values, it really, we conceptualize it and lots of people in the literature do, not so much as things that we find important, but as the direction that we want our life to go, how we wanna live our life, what is important to us, not as tangible items or people, but as more of a direction or on a compass. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by the difference is, we definitely can value family and we can definitely value friends, but we also wanna look at it on a broader scale of what about that am I valuing? Do I value connection with others? Do I value being competent? Those sort of phrases are more about the direction that we want our life to take. It's important to reflect on those because we all have very different values that we hold for ourselves. And recognizing what our values are 
can help us to feel more motivated in terms of moving forward and being able to say, okay, I got to stop with the excessive avoidance because it's not helping me move towards my values. There's lots of different resources online um, that help you kind of give you lists of values or there's different activities that you can do to help understand what your values are. So it's important to kind of do that work either on your own or with the help of a therapist to reflect on what your values are. It's also important to note that sometimes our values are different than those of our family, those of our community, um, of the people around us. So if we are holding the values of other people or that we have been taught we need to value, it can be really difficult to get out of that avoidance, right? If I've been taught that I need to value kind of certain qualities or certain things in life and I just don't in myself, I'm going to probably be drawn to avoid more and more because how do I face that discrepancy? So we really want people to think about taking the time to reflect on their own values and how they might differ from those around them and what they think they can be doing to move towards them. So in my own example, I really do value connection with others. And if I think about my own life, I'm pretty good professionally. I can do the connection piece professionally, but I am that person that Andrea referenced that isn't responding to text messages necessarily. That's one of my avoidance strategies. So for me, I really need to bring myself back to this idea of valuing connection with others to help me recognize and motivate myself to respond to those friends and to foster those relationships. Once you have an idea of what your values are, and they can change between times and between circumstances, but once you have a sense of some of the values you want to work towards, it's important to set goals around them. And a lot of you have probably heard of the acronym SMART goals. Um, if you haven't, you can always Google it, SMART. Um, but the important thing is that we want our goals to be realistic. So if I say that my value at this moment is connection with others, and I say I'm going to respond to every contact in my list and every person I've neglected, that's going to be too big for me, and I'm going to get overwhelmed. And what am I going to do? I'm going to avoid. So it's important to be able to say, what do I value? How can I set very realistic goals for myself to move towards that value? Recognizing that we really just can't do it all at once. And sometimes it's nice to be able to share our goals and our plans with other people. So there's a nice accountability that can come from sort of sharing what you're working on with a friend or someone that's safe someone that will also be showing you self-compassion. So we can't be going to people who are going to criticize us, who are going to be too harsh with us if we're not moving towards the goal at the pace they determine. We really want to share it with someone who can be compassionate with us, maybe demonstrate it for us, and then also walk alongside us. So that accountability is really helpful. Now I'm sure Andrea will text me and remind me to text other people after this presentation. Um, after you kind of look at your values and your goals and you start to work towards them, there are some different activities that can help us to set the stage to sort of cope in this healthier way and not, fo uh, not focus too much on avoidance. So I'm sure as people are reading these terms, at least some of you, there's the idea that like, we all hear these things. We all hear that we should journal. We all hear that we should meditate. We all hear we should go to therapy lately but we're thinking about it in a very particular way. So there is nothing wrong with journaling about just generally how your day was or something that you're thankful for in the day. But when we say journaling here, we are looking at actually taking the opportunity to write out your thoughts, write out where you're noticing that you're avoiding and increasing your own awareness of your avoidance patterns. So that is kind of the way that journaling can help. Sometimes if we're recognizing, I'm really just not facing this problem that I need to face, it is helpful to write about it and to be able to sort of understand better what are the thoughts that I'm having and what is getting in the way of me facing this. So that's sort of what we mean by journaling. In terms of mindfulness and meditation, um, this is not meditation for the purpose of relaxation. What we mean by mindfulness practice is really taking the opportunity to become more aware 
of what we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. So mindfulness practice increases our awareness in a non-judgmental way of what we're experiencing in the moment. So it is sort of the antithesis of avoidance, Mm -hmm. right? Mindfulness is where you are going to sit with those feelings or sit in that state of avoidance and really be wondering, what am I feeling? What am I thinking? What am I experiencing right now? So it's trying to get us to intentionally focus on what we're feeling and why that might be driving our avoidance. Mindfulness is not necessarily comfortable. That's a big, important, I think, message that I've had to learn in my own practice. It is not necessarily for the purpose of being comfortable, for the purpose of relaxing. For those of us who are really good at avoiding, mindfulness can be incredibly uncomfortable because suddenly I'm going to feel that rush of anxiety. I'm going to feel all those things that I grab my phone to not feel anymore. But if you can do it in a safe and kind of slow pace and start to practice it, you will learn that those feelings, they're informing you of something. They're not necessarily a threat, right? So just because our nervous system is really, really ready to respond at any perceived threat, our nervous system is also much more willing to give us false positives than false negatives, right? It wants to alert us a hundred times, even if there's only one threat, as long as it doesn't miss the threat, then miss the threat and not remind us enough. So if we have programmed that these threats are intolerable and uncomfortable, we're going to want to keep avoiding. But mindfulness can give us the opportunity to start to actually experience them, understand what they are, and learn that just because I'm having these sensations doesn't necessarily mean I'm threat- they're threatening to me. So that's what I mean by mindfulness. And then the last thing is therapy. There is definitely benefit um, to engaging with a therapist if you are finding that you are engaging in excessive avoidance and you really aren't sure why or you aren't sure how to get out of it. So one thing that we didn't have a lot of time to touch on today and probably some of you are thinking about is that the term avoidance is also pretty common within um, attachment theory. So attachment theory speaks to uh, the relationships that we have with our caregivers when we're infants and how that shapes our expectations, our views of relationships moving forward. So avoidance is one of the categories of attachment theory. And that one occurs when we weren't getting our emotional needs met as infants. So we sort of learn to suppress them. We learn to not engage with them which can then really lead us to, as adults, engage in lots of excessive avoidance. So therapy can help for lots of reasons. It can help us identify where is the avoidance coming from? Was it an attachment issue? Is it that you're misunderstanding your nervous system? And how can you come to a place where you are getting some help to balance out avoidance that is necessary and healthy versus other strategies to get you moving towards your values and goals? One more slide. So the last one that we like to remind everyone of is we want balance. Andrea and I, I think we say balance and middle path and all those nice words about the middle all the time in our sessions. It is so important to balance engagement and avoidance. Mm-hmm. If you leave this session and you say, I'm just going to stop all my avoidance strategies. I'm going to stop it all. I'm going to avoid the avoidance. It's not going to work. Mm-hmm. It will become overwhelming. There's a reason you're coping this way. So it's recognizing that we really have to be realistic. We all have different capacities for facing fears, for experiencing what our body is trying to tell us. And we need to be able to set our own boundaries and be really honest with ourselves about how much we can face right now and how much we can engage versus how much avoidance is actually still working for us. So if avoidance is at the point that it's preventing you from engaging in any of your values and goals in that movement, then likely we need to kind of move you over to find more balance. Once you find that balance, then you actually learn what your capacity is and when you're getting to the overwhelmed point or when it's a situation that you can't change and you've thought about it long enough and you can't do anything about it and you need a break. 
So we really want avoidance to become a coping strategy that you use when it's needed and not a way of life anymore, right? It can't be our go-to for any moment of stress. We want to learn how to engage in stress in a healthy way, but knowing that it can be a coping strategy that we use when it really is needed to prevent us from becoming incredibly overwhelmed. So we just want to highlight a little bit uh, some of the extra resources. So this is obviously, like Andrea said, this is a bird's eye view of the topic of avoidance. It is all over the place um, and it's super important to understand. The two books that we reference here um, are about understanding our emotions, which is important. Um, then there's also, I referenced uh, attachment theory. So if you're interested, if you're thinking, okay, maybe some of my early experiences, some of my early relationships are shaping the fact that I tend to avoid, you can Google and look into attachment theory. If you were interested in what we talked about, my brief, brief overview of our nervous system, Polyvagal theory, which I think we write in the references section, is um, a theory that is really looking in a nuanced way about how our nervous system protects us. And it really talks about the difference between that fight or flight response and that freeze response. So polyvagal theory is something you could look further into. Um, and then Andrea referenced Kristen Neff, who is a great resource for the, the topic of self-compassion. So this was just a scratching of the surface. Um, but we hope that it helps you. We hope it helped normalize the topic. We hope that we recognize we all avoid and that you're able to sort of start to think about ways either you yourself or clients that you work with can start to move maybe away from the excessive avoidance and into a place where they're finding balance and moving towards their values and the things important to them. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Amanda and Andrea. That was so informative. And just to echo everybody in the chat talking about how they have aftercare sessions they're running this afternoon and they're like, we're going to use all of this. So thank you so much. So it's just like you have such a way of just deconstructing everything and putting it in such a like relatable and tangible way. And I really appreciated like the real world examples that you provided. So thank you for that. Um, now to get into questions. There's lots, so <laughs> let's get into them. Um, okay, so the first question, how does one know um, they are avoiding emotions due to over-regulation of emotions? What are signs that identify this? That is a really good question. Uh, and um, okay, there, there are multiple answers, but usually, when we are over-regulating our emotions, the, the, the experience that I hear from people is that people have become really skilled at kind of putting a rock on it and then another rock on top of it and then another rock on top of it and just closing that lid. And it's closed and we are never going to touch it. And we just go through life and nothing bothers us. And it's okay. And sometimes you feel a little nervous, but then we do something very quickly that closes that lid again and again, and again, and again, and usually with people that um, tend to overregulate for a living, there is always a moment, one big moment when something is way too much and something, there's a huge explosion and everything <laughs> comes, comes out. Um, and so, and that's, and that may be a moment where like, there's an awareness of, oh, maybe something needs to change, or suddenly I became this very dysregulated person, but before I wasn't. Um, but that's, uh, I'm also, because Amanda and I were just talking about this earlier <laughs> this morning, and I'm also thinking about a client story she told me, and I don't know, Amanda, if you, if you want to share more about that. Um, yeah, so I was thinking also, and I think this kind of speaks to the client too, there's, I think one of the signs that were over-regulated is often this sense of being stuck, but not necessarily feeling a whole lot about the fact that we're stuck. It's like we're uncomfortable because on a rational level, we know that we're maybe not facing the things that need to be faced or doing the things that need to be done, but we can't quite generate the internal motivation to do it. So I think that that is sometimes a surface level sign as well. Um, 
So maybe just for the sake of other questions, we'll let Jeremy take another one. But I, I think that it's true. There's this idea of being disconnected that Andrea said, and eventually something kind of triggering an explosion, or just that general sense of you almost feel like there's a little something wrong and you can't quite identify it. I'm feeling mm -hmm. stuck, but I can't really generate enough feeling to do anything about it. Yeah. Um, and then we have a question uh, pertaining to Indigenous populations. So how prevalent are these behaviors in Indigenous populations? Is it included in assessment? Mm. I actually have to confess that I haven't studied enough to answer that in, in a helpful way. I do, I, and the honest answer is that I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, we, we know that there's some, there's some um, research around um, substance use in Indigenous uh, populations that points that towards the, how, how that is a mechanism that is very, um, that is very used. However, I would, I would venture to say, when you look at any population that has experienced tremendous amount of trauma, obviously, because of everything that was explained here today, there is going to be a high reliability on avoidance mechanisms, because actually these people know in their bodies, in their experience, and they have seen it with their eyes and lived through hell. Right. So when you have that amount of trauma that really floods your nervous system in a way that the body knows for a fact this is not safe, of course, then uh, it's 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 absolutely it makes absolute sense that people will rely on uh, avoidance scoping to survive. And that then becomes a, a mode of survival. And that and that is something that. Uh, now that I, in retrospect, I, I think about, oh, maybe we could have made a slide about trauma and avoidance because, of course, it's it's no longer safe to feel. Um, the uh, People that have survived trauma have been pushed to the limit and they now have to survive with, uh, with that knowledge and with that experience. And a lot of times avoidance is very helpful in in diminishing the, the discomfort, the pain, and helping people continue to integrate themselves in, the, in life, but not in an actually engaged way, just kind of like sleepwalking, going through it because it's so, so painful to go through that. For sure. And then, yeah, there's just a note about uh, intergenerational trauma as mm -hmm. too. So like that would be something that indigenous communities obviously experience at a high level. Yeah. And like you said, there's potential for another webinar for trauma and avoidance. So <laughs> look out for your inbox. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. And then to kind of go off of that too. Um, what is the difference between self-soothing when emotions are challenging versus avoidance? They, they can overlap, right? Like, so it's, this is sort of speaks to the fact that like, we do need these strategies. We do need to be able to use our self-soothing, use our distraction. All of those are coping strategies that like avoidance is an umbrella term, right? It can encompass all of these things. You might consider it self-soothing a type of avoidance. For us, the most important thing isn't necessarily what it is. It is about like the intensity of it and if it's interfering. Mm -hmm. But I yeah. think that there's an overlap between them for yeah. sure. And, and I'd say the intention that we go about using a certain skill changes what it is, right? Like if suddenly... This, the, the Instagram example Amanda shared happens to me all the time. To me, it's not Instagram, it's YouTube, but same, same thing, <laughs> tomato, tomato, right? Because <laughs> suddenly I wake up from one hour of scrolling and I go, what just happened? That probably is more avoidance. But if I purposefully turn on the TV and say, you know what, I'm really tired and I just want to laugh and I'm going to put a, a stand-up show and I'm going to enjoy it. And that's going to be my next hour. Then I'm self-soothing. And maybe I have a nice drink or maybe I have my favorite blanket around me and I do all these things that really tell my nervous system, you're safe, everything is okay here. And then I'm self-soothing. So I really think the intention with which we go about doing a certain activity 
instead of sleepwalking through it, really changes um, what we call it. For sure, yeah, that makes total sense. And with you, YouTube, mine's Netflix. I have my go-to comfort shows, right? That I just put on. I need something to be a background so that I'm not just sitting there like wallowing. <laughs> so I'm just like, oh no, I'm watching The Office for the ninth <laughs> time. But it's, yeah, everyone has their different coping yeah. mechanisms, like you said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. glad I'm not alone. Definitely yeah. not. <laughs> not. Right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then. There is questions about anger leading to violence. So if there's avoidance within anger and then leading to potential violence, where does like this all fit into the grand scheme of regulating your emotions and avoidance? I'd say that depends on who's asking that question. If that question is being asked by the person that acknowledges anger in themselves, and, and noticing that, I'd say for sure, seeking help would be the next best uh, step. Because when it comes to anger and the potential that it has for harm, then we're talking about something that actually needs more of an immediate response. And then if that question is being asked by a person that is faced with the anger, so they're recognizing this in a person in their lives or a partner, I, I would say then we need to focus on safety, on how, how to stay safe and how to make sure that, you know, when this other person there that they're seeing is actually getting really angry and, and not aware, how can this second person then go and do and be in a position where they, they are safe when they're not? And if there's any, because I don't know the level of anger, but, um, and safety is a very, uh, it depends on each person, right? It's a very personal, what, what makes a one person feel unsafe may not make the other person feel unsafe. So I would just say it depends. If, if somebody's acknowledging that in themselves, please seek help. If it's about another person, please stay safe and take action towards staying safe. And I was going to just add quickly, because for other people too, you might be wondering this idea of the over-regulation leading to the explosion, just whatever that explosion might be. Um, and that, that actually does speak to also the importance of these like mindfulness practices of doing the things to get more in touch with our emotions. Because if we are people that excessively avoid and over-regulate until something major, good or bad happens, and we start to feel things, that speaks to doing some of that slower background work of mindfulness, of journaling to get to know your emotions on a less intense level. Yeah. Absolutely. Then we have time for one more question. So what happens when purposeful avoidance becomes derealization and disassociation? Are there approved medications and counseling for those? There's definitely counseling for that. So um, oftentimes like it is actually hard to differentiate. Generally people that are experiencing intense levels of dissociation and derealization would be individuals who've experienced some trauma. So it is a common PTSD symptom and there are definitely, um, therapeutic modalities that would speak to it. So polyvagal theory um, is one that really looks at how you can start to kind of regulate your different nervous system states. Um, and it speaks to, in particular, that freeze or dissociative state and how we can move ourselves out of it. So on a one minute answer, I would say looking at that and or looking at trauma therapists. <laughs> that sound okay, Andrea? Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Got the thumbs up. So that's incredible. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Amanda, Andrea, thank you so much to echo again, informative, insightful, and the real world examples were second to none and really just put everything kind of in perspective. So thank you so much for this and for your time today. We really do appreciate it. Thank you all thank so you. much for coming. Yeah. Thank you for having us and for being here. Really thankful for everybody. Course. And to everybody else, thank you so much for your attendance in today's webinar. As noted at the beginning of the webinar, we will be sending out a follow-up email sometime mid to late next week that will include a copy of today's presentation slides, the recording of today's webinar, additional resources, and your CEU certificate. We look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Take care.